begins in October of 2009 as I am walking through the port of Miami. I had just signed off of a cruise ship that I lived and worked on for the previous 119 days. <laughs> and I am very, very excited because I'm about to start a brand new chapter of my life and I'm extremely nomadic at this point. Because behind me I have two very big suitcases and a backpack on my back. And this comprises about 46% of everything I own in this world. <laughs> Around the corner, full of vim and vigor, and then I see the dog. More specifically, the drug-sniffing German Shepherd. And I know that I've made a terrible error in judgment. Whoa. Awesome. <laughs> That's our one glitch for the mission. We're fine. <laughs> Damn it, I lost it. Uh, in my wallet, wrapped very tightly in cellophane and scotch tape because it was a premeditated crime, was, um, uh, was $4 remaining of a $10 bag of marijuana. Let's, let's be cool and not judge me. I have no choice but to go forward, so I walk past the dog and he gives me a friendly sniff and the agent with the leash gives me a little bit of customs humor and says, uh, Ah, uh, it's my first day. I don't know if he bites. <laughs> I give him a <laughs> everything's cool. <laughs> and I continue walking forward. I get about two feet from the door when I hear him say, Excuse me, sir. My dog has just informed me that you have an illegal substance on your body. Is that true? No, I'm busted. The dog is absolutely correct. <laughs> I have no recourse at this point, so I'm hoping that charm and forthrightness will prevail, and I say yes. At which point his friendly demeanor is gone. All right, sir, here's what's gonna happen. This man is a federal agent. He and I are gonna escort you back. We're gonna search your things. We're gonna treat you with courtesy and respect. Do you understand everything I just said to you? Yes. <laughs> they take me to a back room with a lot of long tables and all my stuff is laid out and the search begins. It is at this point that I am introduced to a customs agent who has been assigned to me, a man who I will now refer to simply as the Hardon. <laughs> now the Hardon didn't like me from the beginning. He did not like my vibe or my drug smuggling ways one bit. <laughs> and I... I'm so nervous, and I start to sweat, and I'm a nervous pitter, and I just, I can feel it dripping off of me, and I ask him, uh, what's, what's gonna happen to me? And he says, oh, I don't know, man. You messed up. You messed up big. You're probably going to jail. Gusher, gusher. At the other end of the table, another customs agent starts going through my suitcase, and he pulls out a manila envelope about yay big. Now I know what's exactly in this envelope because I packed it and kept it secret for the previous 119 days. <laughs> in it are five unpackaged DVDs that are just part of my collection. <laughs> and once he sees the title and cover art, he's going to know exactly what these are. So suppressing all embarrassment and summoning all the strength I could muster, I lean across the table and say, that's porn. We're about to open an envelope of porn. <laughs> he opens it and I am proven correct. <laughs> At which point the hard-on says to me immediately, and I quote, Kitty porn? Better not be kitty porn. <laughs> You're in enough trouble as it is. <laughs> now there are times in certain situations where I react verbally, hoping that my charm and wit will prevail. Uh, but I don't know where I summoned the moxie in this particular moment. But I said, I know marijuana is a gateway drug, but I think kitty porn is pretty far down the path. <laughs> he found this neither informative nor true. <laughs> Uh, they take me to a Guantanamo Bay room in the back, and they're going to search my bathing suit area. And um, the hard gets behind me and uh, has me undo my belt, and he says, I'm going to touch you. Is that all right? <laughs> Once again, I don't know where the moxie came from, but uh, I said, yes, as long as I'm not forced to touch you. 
<laughs> At this point, I was 0 for 2 for the day. <laughs> uh, we go back into the room, and the Harlan starts to go through my backpack. And in my backpack are all the very special things that I will not check when I get onto an airplane. The things I want to keep on my person. And he pulls out this book. This book that says 2006 right here. And it is my journal from 2006. My handwritten, meticulous, and intricate journal from 2006. And he opens it up to the page that you always open to when you open this book because there's a paper clip with a newspaper article attached to the corresponding day. And on it, it reads, Family Held Hostage Overnight in Heist. This intrigues him. <laughs> and he starts to flip through and read as he goes. Now, this section to this section is one event. One event that I poured over for a very long time trying to find meaning. And he starts to go through this section. And he sees something. And I don't know exactly what he saw. But he looked up at me and he asked, what is this? Here's the answer. In January of 2006, I received an early morning, uh-oh, this can't be good, phone call from my mother, who was alerting me to the fact that she had just been diagnosed as terminal and was given six months to a year left to live. Now, the doctors gave her two choices. She could either engage in experimental treatments that were, had a notoriously low success rate, but what they would definitely do is give her pain and almost constant discomfort and possibly only extend her life by upwards of a month. Or she could accept her fate, get her affairs in order, find a way to live comfortably, and live out the rest of her days doing as she pleased. She chose the latter. Now the original plan for when she got to this point, hello, how are you? <laughs> hello. The original plan when uh, she got to this point was that she would move to Atlanta, Georgia to live with her wealthy younger brother, who from this point on I will refer to as Uncle Andy. She was going to live with Uncle Andy and his family in their beautiful, gazillion dollar, immaculately pottery barned home <laughs> where she would have her own floor and there would be nurses and no expense would be spared to make sure that she was completely comfortable in her remaining months. But on the other side of that, she would have to leave her home, one that she had been in for 29 years and had worked very hard to keep and now owned outright. Plus, she would be leaving her doctors at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, which were, coincidentally enough, the top cancer researchers specializing in the type of cancer that she had, which was extremely rare. So, she had a choice in her hands. Now, my Uncle Andy is only six years older than me, but 21 years younger than my mother. Uh, when their parents had him, they had already had three other children, and they were pretty much, you know, done being parents. <laughs> so, um, uh, Uncle Andy was left in my mother's charge, and she essentially raised him. It was a major influence on his life. Uh, he loved her like a mother, but squabbled with her like a sibling. Um, he was over all the time, and she was a major influence in his life. So much so that my first word was not mama or dada. It was Andy. Uh, now, Uncle Andy and I grew into very different men. <laughs> Uncle Andy is a self-made millionaire, a type A personality, always moving forward, always doing something. There's, a, there's money to be made. And you know what? We keep our emotions. We keep those close to our vest because there's a business side to everything. And then there's me. And I'm totally cool admitting this. Before I came over here tonight, uh, because I don't like buying polish, I clean my shoes with a wet paper towel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for applauding terrible hygiene. Uh, now, uh, my mother, Patty, uh, my eyes can be described as a lovable eccentric who liked to do things her own way. Case in point, when I was nine years old, my parents were voted Homeowners of the Month, and our picture was going to grace the cover of the Inlet Beach Social. Have you heard of it? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so we went down to the tennis courts to have our picture taken by the professional photographer, and he lines us up, me, my father, and Patty. And as he's backing up, he says, okay, just look at that tree behind me. Now, my father and I, knowing exactly which tree he meant, yes. looked right at. Yes. Patty, on the other hand, yes. as she admitted later, thought, oh, that's just too easy. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't mean that one. <laughs> so she went about 25 degrees to the ground, <laughs> found a tree way off in the distance, gave a half squint, half smile, mm -hmm. and the picture was taken. <laughs> So in Patty's and my shorthand, 
those phrases, those code words that all families have where you know exactly what they mean, staring at your own tree came to mean to do things your own way, to be off kilter or outside of the presumed norm. Uh, Patty also had a penchant for finding the good in situations. And another one of our code words was green crystal. And to put that in context, if either one of us was ever sad or just depressed and just bummed out because just things weren't going well, we would ask the other, what's your green crystal? And what that means is this. In Superman 2, ah, Superman yeah. gives up his powers. <laughs> Immediately upon giving up his powers, the world goes to hell and he's got to get his powers back. But he can't do it. He gave them up. But he, it's a Superman movie, so he does. And uh, he gets the green crystal, the one he found in the original movie, and he throws and makes a fortress of solitude, and he gets his powers back. So green crystal means when all hope is lost and everything seems bleak, what's the one thing that will bring you back? Another bit of shorthand that we had uh, was a subject that we had to broach that neither of us really wanted to, but when she was first diagnosed with this in 99, it became a subject that we had to discuss pragmatically. Um, but we never really wanted to use the word. It was our way of denying something without actually denying anything. Uh, Patty was never going to die, pass away, go to a better place, buy the farm, kick the bucket. Patty was going to move out of Florida. <laughs> Which we thought sounded like a lovelier way to go. So when she called me on that early morning, uh-oh, this can't be good phone call, and told me about the diagnosis, and unenthusiastically about moving to Atlanta, Georgia, I asked her, what do you want me to do? And she said, Kevin, will you come home and help me? Because I cannot bear the thought of moving twice. I knew exactly what she meant, and without hesitation, I said yes. Two weeks later, I arrived at Jacksonville International Airport for my six month to a year visit after a very long and hard travel day. At the top of the escalator, I get on and I start going down and I see Patty at the bottom of it and she just has the biggest smile on her face. She is absolutely just so excited to see me. She is beaming and I return the smile in kind and we're just smiling at each other so big as I'm going down the escalator. As I get about halfway down, she becomes a little bit overwhelmed, and who knows, maybe what my return symbolized to her, who knows, but her smile turned to tears and she started to cry. And because I react to crying the same way I do to vomiting, I started crying myself. <laughs> <laughs> when I get to the bottom, we hug each other and I, I say into her ear, are you crying because I've come home to help you or because my plane is two hours late? <laughs> just both those things are making me cry right now. <laughs> and she laughed and I knew that I had made the right decision to come home. Now, what I just told you was a beautiful moment between a mother and a son. But let's not kid ourselves. <laughs> if you boil it down to the bare bones, I was a 35-year-old man living with his mother again in a home we'd not shared in 17 years. <laughs> and it is amazing how quickly we revert to old behavioral patterns. <laughs> Patty and I adored each other, but my God, we could push each other's buttons. If I left glassware or dishes around the house, my God, she would just, ah, I didn't raise that son. <laughs> and she would criticize me in ways that only a mother can. It wasn't what she said, it was how she said it. For instance, very early on in my stay, we were in her car and I was driving and she was in the passenger seat. And we were engaged in what I believe to be a comfortable silence. <laughs> she pipes up with, Kevin, if you're trying to hit every pothole, you're doing a very good job. <laughs> You know what happened next? A tantrum. A big fucking tantrum. <laughs> so we made an agreement very early on that we were in this together and that there were going to be times where we had to look past our roles of mother and son. So we decided that we were going to look at this whole thing like a job. And my job title was primary caregiver. And for me to do my job well, I had to be completely aware of everything that was going on. We had to be completely honest with each other, warts and all. Now the analogy I was given by the doctors, the thing that we landed on that made perfect sense to me as I tried to figure out what was going to happen was this. Those 
uh, 1980s video camera batteries that whenever you charge them on the charger would never fully go back to 100% charge. They would stop at a new point and that's now the 100% charge. So say it goes to 80%, that's, new the, that's the new 100% and we're never going back to this. So she was going to hit certain points throughout and she was never going back to this strength. So that was what we were dealing with this whole time. Uh, but when I first got home, she had some battery life. So one of my job responsibilities was to take her to work every morning at 9 o'clock and then pick her up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and be on call throughout the day in case she needed me. Now this left me ample time throughout the day to live the life of a hot soccer mom. <laughs> <laughs> and when it's on your terms, it's pretty fantastic. <laughs> I, go, I drop her off, I go to the gym for a couple hours where I got in absolutely stupid shape. <laughs> I go have a smart lunch, maybe have a couple of beers at lunch because the world's just so different when you got a little bit of alcohol in your system. Uh, or I would go home and I would engage in my brand new hobby, one that I picked up while I was living at home, one that I'm going to tell you now completely and totally unapologetically. Scrapbooking. <laughs> I love it. I'm very good at it. And I find it therapeutic yeah. and yeah. At the time, I like to describe myself as a 35-year-old heterosexual male with the hobbies of a 75-year-old woman in the body of a 25-year-old gay man. Uh, Patty and I watched a lot of television together and we would uh, engage in lively debates. And uh, there was uh, one thing that happened in a television show we were watching one time that uh, left an indelible mark and it became something that we started talking about. Uh, the following is a paraphrased quote from the movie A Lion in Winter, which is a movie I've never gotten all the way through because it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> but they quoted it on the West Wing. Um, <laughs> so this is the paraphrased quote. We all fall, and it matters. But when the fall is all that's left, it matters a great deal. This springboarded me into one night suggesting, wouldn't it be fun slash funny if we had like a going away party for you, like a, like a grand bon voyage. And she loved the idea and jumped on board immediately. And we were just excited as all crap because uh, I was going to perform in it. She was going to invite people from all through her life, uh, people who had touched her life as much as she had touched theirs. And it was going to be just this fantastical night. We drew up a budget and we were going to spend some dough on this thing. It was going to be great. It became our green crystal at, when, within this muck that we found ourselves in. Um, so then we started working on the guest list. Who are we going to invite? Uh, then we, uh, she came up with a list of 110 people that she wanted to invite to this. And one night I asked her, um, do you want to invite my father? Now, uh, Patty and my father divorced when I was 10 years old after 14 years of marriage. Uh, I have never in my life called my father dad, ever. I've only called him Pop. So after Pop and Patty got divorced, uh, Patty went from being a stay-at-home mom to a single mother in a blink. Uh, and with that left a little bit of resentment. Uh, as much as she liked him, as much as they got along so very well, there was still a bit of resentment attached to it. And that was also compounded by the fact that, you know, in her life, she was only with one man romantically. If you know what I mean. If you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, so when I was a teenager, Patty confessed to me a fantasy, a fantasy about pop, and it was this. Patty, with a hunk on either arm, <laughs> that's her word, not mine, <laughs> with a hunk on either arm is walking down the street. She sees pop and my stepmother sitting on the street. And they have hit financial straits, and they are destitute. <laughs> she walks by them, sees them, flips them a quarter, and then continues walking. <laughs> so from that point on, flipping a quarter meant to win, to triumph, 
to succeed in ways that no one thought you could. So the question was posed, do you want to invite Pop? And she said, yes, of course I want to. They were still very close friends. They had me in common. They always got along. But as she always complained, God, I wish I wasn't so mamby-pamby around him. Um, <laughs> pragmatism and uh, just being realistic kicked in very quickly. And she posed the question one night, Kevin, how do you make a death party fun? <laughs> uh, <laughs> here was one of my suggestions. Uh, <laughs> Patty was notoriously and selectively deaf, and uh, she would miss hearing lyrics in songs a lot. So I said, what if for the music, we used all the songs that you've misheard the lyrics to your entire life? Uh, uh, the first one that I always thought of was um, Donna Summer's Hot Stuff, which she heard as Honda. And for some reason, it made sense that Donna Summer wanted Honda Baby this evening, and Honda Baby did not. Patty was fine with that one, and that made her laugh, and that was great. But then uh, when I suggested Salt and Peppa's Push It, she balked at the idea because the first time she heard it with this mixture of confusion and disdain, uh, she said, did they just say pussy? <laughs> what she thought it was was pussy, pussy real good, and a dick. <laughs> Uh, now, one thing I, w I would like to throw out is that we were not Pollyannas. We were not these emotionless robots who were going through a denial stage of the reason I was home and we're just planning this party and blah, blah, blah. No, we knew exactly what was going on uh, because we had a bit of a reminder. Uh, Patty had a rare form of cancer called a leiomyosarcoma, which is a free-floating tumor uh, that was in her connective tissue that was in this part of her body and was going through and systematically shutting down her organs. Uh, to do this, it had to expend energy. Therefore, it had to expel a waste product, which was in the form of a liquid that would collect on her lungs throughout the day. Another one of my job responsibilities was to take a stent that was connected to the inside of her body, hook it up to a vacuum, and then drain all of that liquid off of her lungs. It was about a minute and a half process, and I would get about a liter of fluid off each time. She would have to give me a signal of when she was done, and then I would have to close the valve. Were either of us to miss this timing, the liquid would be sucked out and then air would be pulled out and would, in her weakened state would give her a heart attack and she would die in front of me. So for a few seconds every day, my mother's life was in my hands. Optimism was a full-time job mm. because we had a daily reminder that this is real. <laughs> On a lighter note. <laughs> <laughs> we had a ball together. We had an absolute fun time. <laughs> <laughs> When she wasn't working or pushing my buttons, uh, we would, I was her companion, and we'd go have little day dates, we'd go have a nice little lunch, we'd walk on the beach, we'd go to used bookstores, um, I would sit in the house and scrapbook, uh, <laughs> um, uh, because I was making a journal this whole thing, she said, why don't you uh, take your scrapbooking skills and bleed that into your journal? And I said, yes, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> uh, because she found me funny, and I found her very funny, um, we played a lot of games together. And one of my absolute favorite games was, how far can the little bald cancer lady get? <laughs> the rules were simple. I would give her a challenge. Say, for instance, we were in Chick-fil-A, and it was very crowded. So it's crowded in the restaurant, and we're in the back, and I would turn to her and say, go break in front of that guy in line and see if he says anything. <laughs> she would agree, and with a big smile on her face, she would go stand next to him and just smile at him until he acknowledged, and more times than not, I swear to God, oh, please, ma'am, please. And we would laugh. We would laugh. Uh, <laughs> Uh, another game we played was one I came up with one night uh, that I thought was fantastic. It was, tell me something you've never told me, and I'll tell you stuff I've never told you. <laughs> because if I was to ever have a free pass in my life with my mother, this was it. <laughs> now, my story that I was going to tell her, I knew I, I had her. 
this is going to be great because I had I had waited three years to tell her this story and to put this in a uh, poker metaphor and to make this the titular section of the show. I had four aces in my hand, a seemingly unbeatable hand, and I was going to throw it down and win whatever contest we had of stories. Here's mine. In May of 2003, I went to a backyard barbecue in Chicago, and it was just such a fun time. There were a lot of friends there. The sun was shining. Uh, <laughs> beer was flowing, and a soccer ball was starting to be kicked around the backyard. And inevitably, the ball went over the fence, the three-foot-high chain-link perimeter fence. <laughs> Me, being in shape, <laughs> volunteer, oh, I'll go get it. I jump the fence, land on the other side, get the ball back in play, and then jump back over and join the game. I did this effortlessly five times. <laughs> Times six. <laughs> As I jumped over the fence, my shoelace got caught on the chain link, taking my feet out from underneath me, and I landed three feet on the concrete on my face. Oh. Patty was absolutely shocked and said, oh my God, Kevin, why didn't you tell me this? And I said, obviously, because I didn't want you to worry. <laughs> It all worked out fine. It all worked out fine. Everything's cool. Uh, but in all honesty, the worst part of this picture to me is the necklace. <laughs> As good as my story was, and sticking with the poker metaphor, Patty had a straight flush in her hand and she threw it down with this. When she was 24 years old, Patty was going to marry my father. Uh, her roommate at the time in college was her maid of honor, and Patty, never being one of the popular kids, was kind of nervous to have a wedding shower thrown in her honor. So uh, she was a little nervous. And uh, the roommate said, don't you worry, I'll take care of everything. We cut to the day of the shower, and it's Patty, my grandmother, and the roommate sat in a sparsely decorated room for over an hour, and no one showed up. To a 24-year-old woman, this was a devastating and defining moment in her life. I asked her if she realized that she had raised the stakes on something that was already really high stakes, and she said yes, she was fully aware. Five days before the party, I am standing in the living room holding a glass of ice water, and I'm standing next to a wooden table. Uh, she walks out of her bedroom talking to me about something or other, I don't remember what, uh, but suddenly her battery life shifted, and she just went blank and just started to fall face forward towards the linoleum. I react quickly. I put down the glass of ice water on the wooden table, and I dive and I catch her. I get her on the ground, I revive her, I get her to the couch, call an ambulance, get her to the hospital, and I am told that she's probably not going to make it through the night. On a lighter note, <laughs> uh, as we're sitting on the couch, holding hands, <clears throat> waiting for the ambulance to arrive, engaged in what I believe to be a semi-comfortable silence, she says to me in a tone very reminiscent of hitting every pothole, Kevin, Will you move that water glass? <laughs> it's going to leave a rain. Family held hostage overnight in heist. Four months after the events that I just told you, a few men decide to rob a bank, specifically a SunTrust bank in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Their plan is very simple. They're going to scope out the parking lot. They're going to find a bank employee with keys. They're going to tail them home. They're going to break into their home. They're going to hold them hostage the entire night. They're going to bring them to the bank the next day, have them be let into the bank where they have unfettered access to the vault. Their plan, the first part of their plan goes off very well, and they target a man named Josh. They get to his house, they get in, and they start to hold him hostage for the night. Josh's wife becomes concerned. She's working the graveyard shift at a hospital and has not heard from her husband the entire night. So she calls Josh's best friend and says, I've not heard from him, will you go check on him? Josh's best friend turns to his wife and says essentially this bit of information. I'm going to Josh's house, it's a 45 minute drive. I'm going to stay there overnight because it's 10.30 at night and I will just shower at the office tomorrow. Don't worry about me, I'll see you at dinner tomorrow night. 
Josh's best friend drives to Josh's house and becomes even more concerned when he does not hear from Josh, but when he gets to the house, the house is dark, but Josh's vehicle is in the front uh, driveway. The best friend takes the spare key that he has and walks into Josh's house and is greeted by a huge man holding a gun in his face. Josh's best friend, you know better at this point as Uncle Andy. Now, immediately upon Uncle Andy entering this, their plan is thrown into a tizzy. And the first order of business when they call a man off site to say we have a new player in this is kill him. He's done. Get him out of here. What proved Uncle Andy's worth was the fact that he was also a bank employee, also had keys, and they had now stumbled upon a two birds with one stone type scenario. What they did do to make sure that he complied with their wishes is they took his driver's license, read it to a man who was off site, and told Uncle Andy, if you do not agree to do what we ask you to do, he'll go inside. Uncle Andy has no choice, so they wait out the night. The next day, they go to the bank. They take care of everything. They do their business. Andy and Josh's job is to sequester all of the bank employees into a conference room while the bank robbers do their business. The bank <coughs> robbers do their business, and they escape with $75,000 cash. They steal Josh's truck. They drive it two miles away where they get into a getaway car, and they get away. Immediately upon this being done, Uncle Andy runs, calls his family, everything is okay, everything worked out all right. 400 miles away, I am at my childhood home in Florida, cleaning it out, doing all the things that have to be taken care of when you're getting rid of a house, and uh, today was going to be the symbolic day that I spread the ashes. And a thing that I learned that day that um, really shocked the shit out of me, quite frankly, is that... I always was led to believe that crema cremated remains are just like sand. <laughs> and that you could do a symbolic throwing them out, but then when you reach in and find out, oh god, there's like rocks and stuff oh. in here. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I had quite a day on my hands. <laughs> Uncle Andy calls me and says, Kevin, I have something to tell you. I am supposed to be driving to his house that night, and I said, what do you have to tell me? And he said, um, I'm not going to tell you right now. Uh, I'm going to wait till you get here. <laughs> <laughs> me, once again thinking, I got this. I got four aces in my hand. I just touched rock and stuff that might have been bone or teeth. And uh, <laughs> I know that when I go to Uncle Andy's house, that I, I, I can pretty much talk about me and my feelings, and that was what will be the conversation that night. Uh, when I get there and I tell him about this, and um, uh, he and my aunt sit me down and say the story that I just told you, therefore throwing down the royal, beating down my four aces. Um, but Uncle Andy does something, as I said before, he's uh, keep his emotions close to his vest. And there was a moment where he completely trusted me, and he became completely overwhelmed by everything that had been going on in just a very short amount of time. And Stoic Uncle Andy began to just cry, and he sobbed in front of me. And this was probably the first time I'd ever seen this. And much like he had done for me, I rubbed his back, and I told him that everything was going to be okay. On a lighter note, <laughs> um, standing up to law enforcement officials, officials must run in the family uh, because uh, the FBI immediately began investigating this crime. And the FBI has two boxes on a form, solved and not solved. <laughs> they really want to check this one. <laughs> so they start investigating Uncle Andy. And when the mundane is put under a microscope, you can start to see a lot of chinks. And the first thing that they started to see was, wait a minute, you left your house at 10.30 at night, you told your wife you're not coming back, and you expect us to believe that everything is just cool with that? Uh, they went after him for a while, and this became a lot of meetings and a lot of uh, questioning, until eventually Uncle Andy, who does not suffer fools lightly, nor take bullshit for any extended period of time, put his hands on the table and said, look, I control millions of dollars of people's money. Do you really think that I would risk all of that for $75,000? I gotta split five ways. 
<laughs> the investigation ended soon. <laughs> Spoiler alert, <laughs> Patty lived through the night. Uh, the next morning at the hospital, uh, it gets better. Uh, the next morning at the hospital, the first words out of her mouth were, this better not mess up my party. <laughs> it didn't, but it left some challenges in her way. She was now much weaker than she was before. Her battery life is a lot, a lot less than it was. Uh, she's having trouble. Uh, uh, talking, getting a lot of words out, and I'm now emptying her lungs about twice a day. But she is released the day before the party to go home. On the way home from the hospital, as I am driving her there, I have to tell her something that I'm a little trepidatious about telling her just because I'm not sure how she's going to take it, which was, just so you know, Pop was insistent that he be at the house when you get home. Is that all right with you? And she paused and she looked at me and said in very typical Patty McGinn fashion, Kevin, do you really think that's the worst news I've ever heard? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no. uh, we arrived at the house and um, Pop is there and he wants to help. Bless his heart, he's a very kind, very nice man. He has always uh, been there for both of us and uh, had always been a stand-up guy. And this time he really wanted to help. And he unfortunately went the route of bossy. He was telling her what she should do. Patty, you should do this, you should do this. No, 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 you don't want to do that. You want to do this. You want to do what I'm telling you right now. And then Patty looked at him and said, thank you so very much, but you can't tell me what to do. You relinquished that right a long time ago. And much like George McFly hitting Biff for the first time in uh, a spin against the car, <laughs> Patty McGann flipped him a quarter. <laughs> and it was lovely to watch. <laughs> uh, uh, about a year later, I interviewed my father and I asked him about that moment and what he thought of that moment. And uh, this is the exact quote he gave me that I memorized. She was literally fighting her way home from the hospital. This was going to be her crowning moment, and by God, she was going to have it. It's like she was saying, you don't get to change my mind. Get on board or get out of the way. This heralds the arrival of someone who wanted to get in her way, because today marked the day of the arrival of all the out-of-town guests, including family members with opinions. <laughs> Not everybody thought the party was awesome, <laughs> or inspirational, <laughs> or cool, or anything. Uh, there were some people that thought it was morbid <laughs> and completely inappropriate. <laughs> uh, uh, one of these people was another one of her brothers, a former naval aviator whose call sign was Fierce. <laughs> now, Uncle Fierce, <laughs> when I was a kid, uh, he sent Patty a t-shirt that he had designed and printed up himself. On it was a fighter jet in missile lock with a three-sentence mantra surrounding it. Live by chance, love by choice. <laughs> Kill by profession. <laughs> now, when I was a kid, I know, he's so handsome. Um, Top Gun came out when I was 14 years old, and the fact that my uncle did this for a living, he might as well have been a fedora-wearing, globe-trotting archaeologist. Because <laughs> to me, he was fantastic. <laughs> But as I got older, I started to see a little bit more of the man. And one of the things about him, and the way he was described to me one time, which I thought really nailed it, was that were you to give Uncle Fierce a $100 bill, a crisp, fresh, new, clean, free $100 bill, he would sigh, sit you down, and tell you what he would have done was given 520s. <laughs> now, <laughs> Uncle Fierce uh, called me a few days before the party and he said, you know what, Kev? Keep in mind, this is uh, in no way what he sounds like. 
This is a very inaccurate impression. <laughs> Kev? You know, I think this party is inappropriate at this point. I think we should cancel it. Now, I've never stood up to Uncle Fierce before in my life. He, um, he's not that type of guy. But this was my mother's last wish. This was something that I had pledged to her early on that I was going to deliver for her. This was going to be her crowning moment. Plus, quite honestly, I had already spent $8,000 on this party, so there's no fucking way I was going to cancel it. <laughs> so I politely declined his request. Uh, Uncle Fierce, being a stand-up dude, uh, made it clear that he wanted to help, and wanted to help in any way he could. And he said, Kev, Inaccurate. <laughs> <laughs> How can I help? What do you want me to do? And I said, this, we have to plan this party. I had some friends flying down from Chicago who were going to come and help me out. Some very funny, some very smart people who were going to really help me out on this to make something that was, that could be really, really awkward for everyone into something funny, kind of a fun little night. And um, I said, I need to have one night where I sleep and I go over this show with my friends, and we figure out what we're going to do, because this is so hard, and I just can't do it. It's just so much. I've got so many plates in the air, and a hospice worker got in my face today and told me I had to sleep. It was a lot. Uh, and Uncle Fear said, Kev, of course, I'll help you. Uh, <laughs> um, I said, will you stay over with her? Will you stay the night and just give me a chance to sleep? I've rented a hotel room six minutes away just to give me time. And he said, sure, no problem. <laughs> and um, he comes over and um, he sees the thing that, I don't know if it really kicked in for him, but he sees me emptying her lungs. And uh, it made it really real to him as well. And this is uh, purely conjecture on my part, but it scared him a little bit. And to be fair, I was used to it, but yeah, it, it was a little scary thing. Uh, but I go and I work with my friends uh, for a little bit, and then I get a call from him saying, Cam, uh, when you said uh, stay over tonight, you were kidding, right? And I said, no. He said, well, I don't think I'm going to do that. This is so inaccurate. Um, I said, wait, what? He said, you need to come home right now. So I come home, and it's very awkward, and he pulls me aside. And he says, Kev, I want to help. You know I'm going to be there for you. And I'll help you in whatever way I can. But I'm not going to help you if all you want to do is go get drunk and raise hell with your friends. My only reaction at that point was just to laugh in his face, <laughs> which he took as, ah, you got me. But in act actuality was, oh my God, he's telling me I should have given him 520s. So I say, fine, just go. Everything's fine. I'll just, I'll deal with it. Uh, but like I said, a lot is going on right now. So I call the one person who I know I can count on because he had already stated how much he wanted to help her and help us. And I call Uncle Andy. And without hesitation, he says, yes, I will come over and I will stay with her. And he stays the night and I get to sleep and I get to work on this thing with my friends and we get it worked out. The next morning when I talk to him, I ask him, how did it go? Or is everything all right? And he said, I sat next to her the entire night to make sure that she was okay, and when I could not stay awake any longer, I slept in the bed next to her to make sure if she needed anything, I would be right there and I would hear her. I don't know if that's all right, but I just did it. And I thought that was one of the most lovely stand-up moves I had heard, and I just was overwhelmed by it. And from that point on, he had earned my eternal loyalty. So we cut to the day of the party. The party arrives. And the Marriott Sawgrass Resort Banquet Hall is absolutely <laughs> beautiful. It's just great. And there are flowers everywhere. And it just there's so many decorations that are really helped along by the fact that a lot of Patty's friends, who were women in their 60s, really just went all out. And they really made this place look festive. And on a side note, and this really sounds like I'm bragging, but I swear to, I swear to you I'm not. When you go home to help your mother in her time of need, women in their 60s, I think you're dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> so the party arrives. And one, and one thing that Aunt, Uncle Andy and I have done is we've made sure that we've covered every possible contingency that we could think of in regards to this party and her. Uh, but the one thing we cannot take into account is her battery life. And uh, about an, 
when she first gets to the party, she gets to see it, and she gets to be welcomed by everyone in there, and then she's got to go away for a little bit, for about an hour, so she can recharge her batteries in the hotel room we had rented for her. Uh, during that time, uh, everyone eats dinner, and I go up and I say the thesis statement for the evening, which was, I show them this picture. This is, uh, <laughs> this is our theme for the night. Uh, what we're seeing is a very unorthodox event, but what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at Patty's tree. And who knows, maybe we'll have a Christmas miracle on our hands, even though it was June. Um, about an hour into the party, I go to the hotel room to see how she's doing, and she's fine, and she can come in. And Uncle Andy says that she's ready, she says she's ready, and I make my way out of the hotel room towards the banquet hall. And I am kind of freaked out at this point. I can't believe that it's actually here, that this thing has actually arrived and that we've made it. And I don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, it was like planning a wedding where the bride might die before it or during it. And um, it was just so much stress. But I can't think about that right now. But I burst in right ahead of her and in my booming stage voice, I say, Ladies and gentlemen, Patty McGeehan. And she enters to her first and her last standing ovation because 100 people are on their feet and they are just going absolutely wild. And it is so lovely to witness. Wow. But the clock is ticking and we don't have time to fuck around. So uh, we get her to her seat and I jump up on stage and I start what we had planned for the entire evening. I played two songs that I've written specifically for the event. The first one being a lovely, touching mother-son song where I tell the story of when I was 10 years old and we were quarantined because we both had mono and she couldn't go shop for Christmas presents. And uh, what she had to do instead was she wrapped rewrapped books that we already owned in the house <laughs> and uh, hid them everywhere and gave me this little uh, clue treasure hunt that I had to find them. And as a 10-year-old kid on Christmas, I fucking hated it. <laughs> <laughs> but as a grown man, I totally get it. Um, and then the next song was one that I wrote from, wrote from her perspective, thanking everyone for coming to this unorthodox event. And because it worked out so beautifully, I used the Golden Girls theme because we actually threw a party and invited everyone she knew. <laughs> uh, so then we move on to the slideshow presentation. And what I did is I went through our extensive archives of pictures because I'm unapologetically a scrapbooker. And uh, I put together one slideshow of everyone who was invited to that party so everybody got to see a picture of themselves up on the screen so they could feel like they were a part of this as well. And then the next one, uh, the next slideshow was the theme haircuts Patty and I have shared throughout the years. And, whoops. <laughs> Wondering, I'm the taller zittier. <laughs> so, with the slideshows complete, we move on to the next section, which was because Patty was the real, the, the only common denominator in the room. Not everybody knew each other, so I had her write down three facts about each person, so I could introduce the room to each other. Because, as she put it, I'd like to have people talk about something other than me. So uh, I introduced the room to each other, and it's just so light and fun and so very funny because everybody knows that this is what Patty said about them. Uh, Uncle Fierce, on a side note, uh, the three things she listed for him, brother, pilot, donkey owner. <laughs> All true, and Fierce was none too pleased. <laughs> So this is just going along wonderfully. It's very funny and very light, and it's just a great night. And then uh, the next stage is, I am now going to offer up the microphone to anyone who wants to say something in the room. And someone steps up to the mic and makes the biggest error I have ever seen, thereby warranting them a nickname as well. So Boner Move takes the microphone. <laughs> Boner move. Uh, Boner move and I went to high school together. Patty was friends with his mother, so she invited their entire family. And Boner move and I used to be funny together in high school. And because the evening was going really well, I think Boner move wanted a piece of the action. So he gives a little speech at the beginning, and then concludes it with, "Now, Patty, when we were in high school, myself, another guy, another guy." 
We all thought you were a MILF. Oh. Now, <laughs> not many people in that room had seen American Pie or were fans of that particular subgenre of porn. <laughs> <laughs> Including Patty, who could be described as prim, proper, and prudish. <laughs> so it doesn't get the laugh he feels it so justly deserves. <laughs> so he takes it one step farther. Oh, no. And he defines the acronym. Oh. You're a mom I'd like to fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Let's recap the evening. <laughs> she enters to her first and her last standing ovation, and it is lovely. I sing two songs that she's absolutely taken by, and in a lifetime movie moment, because she's seen these uh, and heard these songs so many times, she begins to mouth along, and it's just so lovely to witness. Oh my gosh, everybody's being introduced to each other, and it's so funny and fun. <laughs> You're a mom, I'd like to fuck. <laughs> this is the moment it happens. This is my Zapruder film. <laughs> So the rest of the evening goes fine. Uh, the party concludes with her having a receiving line where she gets to say goodbye to everyone and more importantly, everybody gets to say goodbye to her. Uh, when Boner Move comes up to her at the very end and says, oh, Patty, this was a lovely evening. She says, you should not have done that. <laughs> So with the receiving line done, uh, and her being able to say goodbye to everyone, uh, she called me over to her right before she's about to leave, and we began talking, and then uh, she scans the room and then lands on my father and says, I think I got my quarter. And I said, yeah, I would say that you did. And then she looks at me and says, thank you, Kevin. This was so much better than my wedding shower. <laughs> to which I respond, you're very welcome, but that one really wasn't hard to beat. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Andy, who had been by her side the entire night, wheeled her out, and her green crystal, the thing that kept her going when all hope seemed lost, was now complete. Eight days later, as I was holding her hand, she moved out of Florida, and when the fall was all that was left, it mattered a great deal, and she did it, staring at her own tree. The next morning, I was in my driveway of my childhood home, standing with Uncle Andy, and everything just got me. I was just uh, hit by a wave of just emotion, and I couldn't believe that all of it was over. And I just crumbled, and I just began to cry. And much like I would do for him four months in the future, he rubbed my back, and he told me that everything was going to be okay. Two very different men lost a mother, but in the process shared something where each of them gained a brother. And on a lighter note, if you look closely, same haircut. <laughs> <laughs> so the hard on looked at me, pointed at the book, and asked, what is this? I gave him the short answer. It's the journal I kept in the five months I lived with my mother right before she died, but everything worked out okay because we gave her a party. <laughs> <laughs> and the hard on's face changed. And he asked me, was it cancer? And I said, yeah. He said, my grandmother just died of cancer. I said, I'm really sorry to hear that. And then suddenly I was humanized to him and I was no longer the guy that he had very recently accused of owning child pornography. <laughs> and we talked, and we commiserated, and he told me a joke. What do you get when you cross a brown chicken and a brown cow? Brown chicken, brown cow. <laughs> <laughs> I gave him a, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> He conferred with the CEO, 
and they both agreed that my crime was not that egregious and that I should just be released without charges. <laughs> There's no record. I don't have a record. I was given a, a slap on the wrist. I had a small fine and the fact that um, my name is now on a list. So if I go to the port of Miami, my things will be searched. But I found my loophole. Yeah. I'll never go to the port of Miami. <laughs> <laughs> There are many things that I got to thank Patty for, specifically the party, which was as much of a gift for me as it was for her. I walked out of that house different than how I walked in, and I truly believe it was for my betterment, because I saw that there was so much strength and acceptance, pragmatic optimism, and doing things your own way. But the thing I never got to thank Patty for was for encouraging me to scrapbook and journal because ultimately, both those things helped me avoid federal drug charges. <laughs> 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 <laughs>